Welcome. Thank you for joining Snow Isle Libraries for the Open Book Everybody Shines panel discussion. Your mics are muted. Use chat to ask questions. We will be using chat on our end to share links to any book lists or websites mentioned today. Look for them at the end of the program. Everybody Shines is a new collection of short stories celebrating body diversity edited by Cassandra Newbold, Pacific Northwest author and host of the podcast, Fat Like Me, where she chats all things fat with authors, entertainers, and activists about life, the arts, and why we desperately need more body diversity in KidLit today. Cass is joined tonight by four contributors to the collection. Kelly DeVos is the Arizona-based author of Fat Girl on a Plane, her work has been featured in the New York Times, Salon, and Bustle. Francina Simone is a storyteller, comic illustrator, and author of the Guardians Trilogy, a young adult urban fantasy that explores the strength of love and loss. Her stories are full of humor and hard life lessons with sprinkles of truth that make us all feel understood. She's joining us from slightly to the east tonight. Rebecca Skye joins us from Vancouver Island. Her debut series, the Love Curse started on Wattpad and received over 10 million reads before getting picked up by a major publisher. Rebecca spends her time writing about fat and disabled babes in all kinds of situations, and she won't stop until every YA trope is filled with body positive protagonist. And Catherine Adele West is the author of Saving Ruby King and her sophomore novel Becoming Sarah King is due in 2022. Catherine's work has been featured in numerous publications, including Black Fox Literary Magazine and the Helix Magazine. She's joining us from Chicago tonight. We've assembled a list of books by our guests and other contributors to Everybody Shines. A link to the book list will be posted in chat at the end of the program. Are you planning to add the works of our guests to your personal library? Support local independent bookstores with your purchases. Find a bookstore near you at bookshop.org. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel with captions in a few days. Check our website often for additional opportunities to hear from authors, illustrators, and audiobook narrators. Now, let's meet our guests. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our conversation tonight. I'm so excited to have everyone here with us. I'm Cassandra Newbold, um, editor and one of the contributors to Everybody Shines. We say in our names. I'm Kelly. I'm <laughs> Kelly DeVos. Uh, I'm the author of Fat Girl on a Plane, Eat Your Heart Out. And I also was really thrilled to be able to contribute the story Outside Pitch to Everybody Shines. Uh, I'm Rebecca. Oh, you go, Catherine. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Catherine Adele West. Um, I wrote the story Orion Star and um, Everybody Shines. Um, many thanks to Snow Isle Library and the lovely Cassandra Newbold for uh, having me out here. Thrilled to be with you and thrilled to discuss body positivity. Mm -hmm. I'm Rebecca Skye and uh, my story was Liar Liar Pants on Fire in the anthology. And um, I also wrote the Love Care series. And I'm also really stoked to be here and having this conversation. Hi, Francine Simone, um, author of Smash It, and Smash I it! contributed. <laughs> yay! I contributed the story, um, Letters to Charlie Brown, which I'm so excited to be part of the anthology and to be here because I love to talk. So thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> my mom, Charlie Brown, by the way. I love this. Oh my God. Uh, I loved it too. Yeah. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I guess we're going to dive in. Um, I'm going to start with an easy question and then we'll continue from there. Uh, what is intersectional body positivity and fat feminism and why is it so important in kid lit? So these are the easy questions because I thought the easy <laughs> questions were going to be like yeah. our name or like where we're from or something like that. <laughs> Girl, I'm sitting up here being like, okay, so am I writing a thesis or like, yeah. <laughs> how long do we have? Level? I'm just, I want to. <laughs> Anyone want to go first? Actually, yeah. you know what? I oh. No, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I just was talking about um, the Lizzo controversy that happened recently. And I think she's a perfect example of at least um, intersectionality that kind of relates to me. 
when it comes to body diversity and body positivity. And I know Lizzo was just, she just released a music video called Rumors featuring Cardi B and she got a lot of backlash yet again for just daring to be fat and sexy. <laughs> and so, actually I shouldn't even say that, just daring to be fat in herself, honestly. I think even I just put the label of sexy onto her just because she embodies herself, whatever that means, whenever she feels like it. And um, as far as intersectionality goes, I think at least for me, when it comes to blackness and um, body diversity, I've always noticed that as black women, we tend to be objectified sexually, especially at a young age. And so we're constantly put into this paradigm or into this box of what it is that we can do for desirability. And that's it, <laughs> whether it's, and especially like when it comes to fatness, um, if you do not fit the standard of what the idea is for a black desirable, sexually desirable woman, then you immediately, if you are fat um, or fall into any other category, you must be some type of caretaker or someone who entertains and that's it. And those are the only two roles that black women usually can exist in spaces and be successful in the current matrix of things. And so for me, it's been so interesting seeing like women like Lizzo break out of that or even just, I mean, any Black woman to own themselves and to say, it's for me, not for you. And that's been such body positivity in general. But I think um, just for me, that's kind of what intersectionality looks like with body diversity, as far as like how I can relate to it and how um, I can express myself in it. Um. <laughs> No, piggybacking off of Francina, I literally co-sign on everything that she says, especially about like intersectionality, feminism, um, and blackness. Cause I can only speak to you as, you know, I prefer curvy, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm a curvy black woman. My mama says I've never had a small day in my life, right? And she means it positively, not like, you know, like everybody in my family is curvy. So I was just taught from a very early age, curvy is beautiful love your curves, but then when you go into a fat phobic society or you go outside of what I call like, you know, that little positive bubble, you know, all of these labels are thrown on you and at you, whether you want them or not. And then you're inundated with all of this media, right? Telling you that you're not desirable or that there is no place for you other than, um, the sassy black, you know, hey girl, go get your man while I sit here like by myself or I'm like the TSA agent that's like rushing somebody to go get your man, skinny white girl, have a, have a good time while I just sit here as a TSA agent, I don't know, eating Cheetos or, or whatever it is. Like, you know, rarely would we see somebody who was like curvy and black and smart and, and and then if you were these things, people would just look at you like you have a unicorn, you know, like you're that, you know, like you're a unicorn. And then the whole thing, because with the whole Lizzo, personally, I love that video. But the whole thing I think with Lizzo is it's not just her being, you know, fat and, 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 and you know, sexy, whatever label you want to put on her. I think for people underlying it, it's the audience for her to be confident Fantasy. on mm -hmm. top of it mm -hmm. right so I'm like wait so so you fat and you black and you woman and you proud of it you're not like trying to sulk off into a coin like almost like how dare mm -hmm. you and she's like how dare I not so mm -hmm. having some that's why like Lizzo was so big because like having somebody like that um you know and music reading everybody shines and having these positive you know role models in books not just relegated to the sidelines mm -hmm. That's why it's so important, you know, in my mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to add to that a little bit. Like um, when you're saying like, how dare you to Lizzo? That's basically like, that's why it's so important that we're writing for teens because they're being shown how dare you for every aspect of their life. It's like, your skin's too white, here, get a tan. Or your skin's too black, here, get bleaching cream. You know, your eyebrows are too thick, let's wax them. Your eyebrows are too thin, let's tattoo them on bigger. Like no matter what we do, we're getting these messages that we're not enough. And um, that we're not desirable or pretty enough, but like pretty is a subjective term and desirable. Like it's not my job to be what you find desirable. And yet that's the messaging teens are getting um, 
everywhere. And like, there's a, there's a YA trope about the girl who doesn't think she's pretty, but the love interest finds her the prettiest girl in the room. And that's in almost every YA book. Well, why are we, why are we telling teens that it's more important how attractive you are instead of the love interest falling in love with their tenacity or their creativity or their courage, you know, like, Mm -hmm. so that's why, you know, I think Lizzo is a great example. I cried through that music video. There's so many beautiful fat women dancing their hearts out that I want more of that, you know, that's why I think Lizzo is so important and books that feature fat people are so important because we need to be seen. um, And so that people realize that normal bodies are normal, you know, like fat bodies are normal. There's nothing wrong with them. You don't have to make yourself smaller or try to change or be different to fit into a consumeristic uh, viewpoint of what beauty or what worth of your body is. Yeah, well, I guess so how I feel about fat intersectional body positivity and, or, or, you know, or fat acceptance or, you know, that kind of thing. I guess how I feel about it is that I feel like when you have more intersectionality, you get to just break out of only having characters that are ever just fat. Like you get to break out into having like characters that are like, because like everybody has a variety of attributes and a variety Mm -hmm. of problems that they're dealing with. And I always just feel like so many times fat people in storytelling aren't treated as particularly human because it's like the Mm -hmm. only thing that you've got going on is your fatness and no other kind of concern for anything else that is going on in your life. And so one of the reasons why I really like our anthology is it does, there are people telling stories about characters from all kinds of different walks of life, different races, Mm -hmm. you know, different gender identities. And it really shows, you know, it really shows the spectrum of fat people just kind of living life, you know, fat people as people. So that's kind of why I think it's important. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that the more intersectionalities that you have Mm -hmm. um, within Kidlet and and, and beyond, but since we're specifically talking about, um, you know, books for youth, I think it gives the ability to relate uh, a broader space spectrum of people who are looking to still see themselves on the shelf and are lacking. And so when you bring in um, stories where people can connect in multiple ways, it gives them a validation that they belong in the world, which they might not be getting from peers or even from their homes. And I think that that is such a strong building block to developing body neutrality at a young Mm -hmm. age, Mm -hmm. which then even if you're not feeling positive about your body, you aren't hating yourself. And I mean, we all have days that we hate ourselves and we love ourselves regardless of our size. Like that's just sort of the way humans are built. (laughs) And mostly it's because of the media that we're fed to think of ourselves in these terms. But I think that the more you show bodies of all sizes just living the more neutral your reactions are to that within yourself and to others around you and so I think that that's why it's super important and I don't think you can really have feminism without also including fat feminism because you aren't um celebrating all bodies and sticking up for all bodies and really you are very narrow-minded in what you're sticking up for so Uh Yeah. That's the problem with some of mainstream body positivity, though. It's like pretty much thin women going like, oh, I embrace my little bit of cellulite or my role when I sit down. I embrace that and I love myself. Well, that's great and all. But how is your self-love for that role helping somebody fit in an MRI machine or in a doctor's waiting room chair or, you know, like how is that getting a trans person their gender affirming surgery? You know, the, you know, there's things like that um, if, you're, if your body positivity is only focused on yourself, what does that help? Who's that helping? You know, that's not helping dismantle systemic injustice, which is happening to fat people and especially the more marginalized fat people with the intersections of being black or disabled or trans, right? So for me, um, that's why I think what you said is so important. You know, I don't know. It's, it's important to dismantle that and to show fat teens that they're okay. Their body is not the most important part about them. In fact, it doesn't matter. It's just a tool that they get to live life with, you know? And it shouldn't be what what gives them their value. And yet the world tells us, especially women and women aligning people that our value comes first from our bodies, you know? 
But and I so, always think that it's kind of important to talk about the difference between body positivity and like fat advocacy, mm-hmm. or, you know, fat positivity, because body positivity, like everybody can feel good about, you know, everybody deserves some help feeling good about themselves, right? But that's mm-hmm. not really advocacy, you know, that's not, that's not really like addressing the issue. And I feel like I tried to talk about this in background on a plane, and I'm not sure how clearly it really came out, but like, you can feel good about yourself, but if the space that you're operating in is still so fat phobic, your ability to actually accomplish what you want to accomplish is, you know, could still be really, really limited. And so like, I sometimes think that like, we're like hung up on getting people to feel good about themselves. And of course that's important, but like kind of to your point, we really have to change the way in which these spaces operate because you can feel great and you can still be denied a job. You can feel great and you Mm -hmm. can, you know so on and so forth or you you know you can feel great and not have a chair to sit in so I Uh think that like I think it's important to talk about it in terms of like fat positive advocacy versus Uh body positive feeling good yeah Uh definitely um one of the reasons I think everything that we were just speaking out about right now is one of the reasons why we all felt it was very important to get everybody shines on the shelves. Um, What were your first thoughts when you were asked to write a story for the anthology? Oh my God. (laughs) Um, I was, I was thrilled, but at the same time, um, I write adult literary fiction. I've never written YA before. And, you know, I'm, I'm in my, you know, early forties. So I don't like, I'm just like, oh crap. I got to try to remember what it was like, <laughs> like back in 96. I mean, like boys to men was putting out hits. <laughs> so we was wearing like acid wash. We had like denim with the airbrush on it. Thought we was doing big things, you know? So I like, think like all that stuff is The nineties is though. totally back. Yeah. yeah. The nineties is totally back. Like the, you know what I mean? Like it was like peak, like, you know, you couldn't tell me like nothing. Like it was great. Like Keanu Reeves was in speed. Like this was like just all I was I'm like, okay, so I gotta try to revert back to that mindset. So I think for me, I was I was humbled, I was thrilled. Um, but at the same time, I was like, oh, how the heck am I gonna pull this one off and pull it off realistically? You know what I mean? So somebody is not being you like, did. Oh, thank you, baby. I love your story. <laughs> It made me cry. Not right now. Not right. Mm. <laughs> and Cena's right. made me cry too. I was like, so right? Sad. My mama loves peanuts. You don't even understand. <laughs> you don't even understand. But okay, okay, okay. Getting back to it. Getting back to it. Um, I was just very. I was. I was humble. I was scared. But you know, um. It's like right before you like jump off a cliff to skydive, not that I will ever do that, but that's how I imagine it feels. And just kind of seeing where that wind is going to take you, right? <laughs> so it came with like a very loose idea. And, and then like, I just kept writing and seeing what was gonna happen. Um, I, I think that for me, it was about um, finding this platform to, to tell not just fat black girls, but just every fat girl, fat boy, however you identify, gender wise doesn't matter, that you can do whatever it is you said, mm-hmm. even if it's to something as crazy as deciding I want to be a Hollywood director. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? My thighs don't fit in the chair. Heck, I'm going to find a chair that will fit these thighs <laughs> and I'm going to direct these movies. You know what I mean? So it it was about kind of getting that message that you're not limited in size and scope by your size. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and do whatever it is you feel like you need to do. So for me, my story was just about empowerment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And everybody kind of has their own thing, you know, like self-love and all this. But for me, it was all about empowerment. And, you know, just Cass, thanks for even thinking of me because, you know, I was like... So, yeah. I love Orion. She sure. she has a special place in my heart. Uh, so thank you for being a part. <laughs> listen, thank you for having me. I read all of you guys' stories, so don't even play. Don't even play. 
Well, I was just really excited, although I, I'll tell you, and I've said this before, and I hate I, my immediate like depressing thought was like, oh my gosh, is Cass going to find someone to publish this? And she did. So yay. But I guess, <laughs> I guess kind of, I was like super, so I was like super jazzed because I'm like, yeah, that sounds like we really, really need to have this. But I was kind of like, you know, thinking in my brain, well, could we have it? You know, would, would somebody make it? And you know, luckily Bloomsbury did, and that's awesome. So yay. Uh-huh. Yay for me. You know what? I always think about the fact that I was just really excited um, because I was actually talking to Cass about Smash It at the time. So I was just like all on my curvy black girl stuff. And I was like, ah, blah, 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 blah. But I, when I went into it, I actually went into it with a completely different idea of what I was going to do. And I feel like... Um, it's funny, Catherine, because you say like you felt you were humbled and like this and that. And I feel like I got humbled <laughs> because the idea that I wanted to do it first, I was like, oh my God, yeah, like I know what I'm going to do. I'm just, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. And then like when I sat down to write it, I just was like, okay, no, <laughs> this isn't going to happen. This isn't going to work. And I felt like the story that I ended up writing just was like, excuse me, but first we need to talk about what it was like to be you in the real world. This can, it needs to be contemporary. Like we love a fantasy take, okay? We love it, Francina, but you need to first start talking about the contemporary takes because where are those? Where are those for us? And so I realized like, no, I need to write something for what I needed to see and what I needed to, to experience growing up. And so like, I think I, I got humbled by myself <laughs> and, um, but it was just, I like overall absolute blast. I mean, I just, from the jump, I was like, yes, but I'm a very like jump right into the deep end type of person. And then, you know, I like, oh my God, I don't know how to swim. Let's figure this out. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, for me, um, I was kind of lucky to be kind of in on the, the earlier side. Cass and I were at a writer's retreat with some awesome writers in the Pacific Northwest. This is before COVID <laughs> when people could actually see each other in real life. Um, I'm getting nostalgic, but we were, we were both writing books with plus size main characters. And we were basically like, just hyping each other up and being like, somebody's going to want these books, like, and just like putting all our hope into these characters and like, and um, all our hope into having characters that mean so much seen on the shelf. And so I think it was like not a few weeks later, Cass like DMs me. She's like, what if we did an anthology? And I'm like, basically it was a a string of explicits. I was so in a hundred percent in. I had no clue what I was going to write. Um, but I just knew I wanted to be a part of it because it would have meant the world to me to see a character that had my body in a book mm-hmm. growing up. And I didn't have that. I did have it as the bully or the class clown, but never as a person with their own agency. Um, so that's, yeah, that's all I knew I wanted to write when I went in was a fat girl who had her own agency, despite what the world told her that she should have. So um, I, think, <laughs> I think that came, I think that happened in my story. I don't know. I'm really excited about it. I love, I love my characters and I'm so thankful to be in this um, anthology. Like I, I look up to all you authors so much and I feel like super privileged just to be able to write a fat story <laughs> alongside you all. And here comes the tears. Um, but yeah, so thank you, Cass. Thank you. Thank, thank you all you. for like caring about fat kids and fat people because, you know, I didn't get a lot of that growing up. So it's cool to be around people who do. Yeah, I think um, going back to what Kelly said, you know, I also had a fear of if this anthology would sell. And I got to say, we went on sub in the very end of July and it sold in like the beginning of October. So we were only on sub for like barely three months, which I mean, if anybody knows publishing, that's not a long time. Yeah, Yeah. no, like, you know, you can be on sub for legitimately a year or two years. Like when I when I sold Save Me Ruby King, like, I'm not going to tell you how long I was on sub, but it was very short. So when, when I heard, like, I was like, cause you can be, you know, you can be on sub for like a year, uh, at, at least for some. So mm-hmm. for three months. 
Yeah. And, and I have to say, I'm so happy that we found a home with Bloomsbury because they Mm -hmm. have been on board and just had the vision and, and been so supportive and wonderful, wonderful home to have Mm -hmm. this anthology. Yeah. They were already doing the work by publishing like amazing authors like Renee, Renee Watson and stuff. They were already Mm -hmm. doing the work. So it was a place that you could automatically trust that they weren't going to try to thin wash the anthology to make Mm -hmm. it commercially palatable. And it tell you, and, and what got me was the fact that they had fact checkers. Now, I always mm-hmm. make sure what I write is like as correct as possible. But you know, the fact that they were actually checking what I wrote, I was like, that somehow like it, it wasn't it, it made me feel safe. I was like, oh, thank you, God. Safety net. All right. Mm-hmm. You know, just in case, you know what, you know, I, I don't go out looking like a fool like you act, you know, because you have readers who just Actually, you know, technically, this isn't you now correct. So, Bloomsbury, I was child. That was wonderful. Mm-hmm. That was that was wonderful. I also have to say, the, from the collaboration from the beginning to the end, like for those of you that don't know, the person, the amazing person who did our cover, Thaddeus Coates, he is mm-hmm. also a fat man. And so, like this, really, truly, from you know, cover to cover, has been uh, the work of many, many people in all different shapes and sizes coming together to put this book out for who have lived these experiences. And I think that Mm. that um, brings me to my next question. Did you bring a part of your own life story or your teen years since we, you know, all these stories are for teenagers um, into your characters to give uh, a bit of subtlety or like a subtle nod to experiences that people who have never lived in a fat body might, um, cl- you know, uh, click just in, in like maybe one sentence or even a couple of words and go, yes, I know exactly uh, how this feels. I will say that I did. Um, there's a specific line in letters to Charlie Brown where um, the main character, Jeannie, she ends up, she's like definitely in love with her boyfriend, like obsessively so. They have a great connection. And she sees a pretty girl walking by and she goes, do you th- wish that I was pretty like that? And he said, no, because you know, then like his response was essentially (laughs) because then you wouldn't want me. (laughs) And so at first she's like, but then she's like, hold on a second. Are you saying I'm the B grade? (laughs) And like, that actually happens to me at one point with actually my now husband. And the thing was though, and what like, what was beautiful kind of for me to like see as an adult and why I put that in there was because oftentimes when you're fat, when you look different, when you are different, that's like your, your insecurities are on real high. And what people say, you don't ask, well, why did you say that? Why did you feel that way? You immediately take it as a reflection on yourself. And after I grew up, me and my now husband, like, I realized that he said that because he felt like, you know, he just, he wasn't good enough for anybody. And like, like, well, no, I don't want you to be like any more than what you already are. He didn't even know who I was talking about. He didn't even look at anybody that I was saying. It was just the first thing that came out of his mind was like, no, if you're any more perfect than you are, then of course you'll, you'd like, you'd never talk to me. So let's, let's, let's please, please. I'm, I'm struggling here on my own little bus and I, me on my struggle bus, I'm like, how dare you crash my struggle bus. <laughs> and so it was just like little moments like that were so important for me to add in because it was like, you know, that's the stuff that I thought and the stuff that I felt on the regular and having a character who feels and thinks those things consistently, having a character who's heavily kind of flawed or slightly cuckoo, like, (laughs) is Jeannie, (laughs) she's wild. But like having somebody who's like that and it not be centered around anything but just her was like I don't know it was it made me feel like I was on the page and I was like okay also exposing myself (laughs) insecurities and traumas all on the page but that was one of the things that I put in there was just like a lot of her reactions to her insecurities I mean like honestly how is your writing gonna really thrive unless you don't put those things like on the page like for me the whole distant father thing it's real 
So for me, it was about my books always seem about be about reconciliation between like black fathers and black daughters. Hi, dad. Um, <laughs> like for me, the part in Orion that was more telling or, or slightly telling of like things that I struggle with or struggled with with my dad when I was a teenager is when she's trying to edit her 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 um her film and her dad comes in and they have a fight he's like what more do you want from me she's like I wanted you to fight for me like why didn't you fight you know what I mean you just left you didn't fight for me like at all you know what I mean and that's you know just you know it it was something that like I, I I think I felt deep down when I was a kid with my dad like mind you I have a two-parent home but you know father you know emotionally absent dad right so I mean you might as well not be in the home at all so mm -hmm. like you know with Orion I just took that and just physically you know just put him you know somewhere else so when she does have this kind of um you know talk with her dad or rather argument with her dad it, it's just you know that's coming from a real place that and when she was making sloppy joe and did the crunched up doritos like i said <laughs> 19 baby that's how i was eating and also the relationship that she had with her grandma uh grandma Gemma. Mm -hmm. like i had a very close relationship with my uh with my grandma oddly enough the antagonist relationship she has with her mom my mom and i are thick as thieves my mom is never you know, fat shamed or, you know, I mean, like I said, she's curvy, I'm curvy. So it was always very much like a, a loving relationship with my mom. So writing a mom and a daughter who don't have that, now that was a challenge for me. Um, but writing uh, a daughter that has a distant relationship with her father was literally as easy as fine. So I don't know what that says about me, but I mean, you know, like Francina said, just bringing the traumas and the insecurities and stuff to the page. I mean, that's what gives it flavor. Mm -hmm. Well, so I feel like for me, I had the idea for my story outside pitch when I was actually at my daughter's softball game. And I was watching this pitcher who was a fat girl basically pitch a perfect game of softball. And the other team beat my daughter's team and that part was sad. But I was like, you know, wow, like I, I don't feel like, you know, fat people in athletics get a lot of attention. And I really wanted to, you know, mm -hmm. fat people can do things. I really wanted to just, you know, have that be in my story. So that's kind of like where the idea came from. I feel like what was in the story from my upbringing was, and I don't know how other people feel, but... I feel like when you grow up fat, there's always this pressure to be good at all kinds of things because like mm -hmm. you have to make up for the fact that you're fat and taking up more space. So you've got to be like hilarious and you've got to be smart and you've got to be, you know, doing it tr like trying, you know, you've got to have all these witty one-liners all the time and you've got to get A's on everything. And so like, I feel like that was my character and that's kind of what came into it from my upbringing because I just feel like the pressure is always on almost to justify your existence of like why why you're in there you know you can't just be some you know dopey fat person you you got to be like the person that's doing all the work on the group project you know so oh. that, <laughs> that's too relatable <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I kind of felt about it can I just say there's like nine Olympic athletes that won medals that were fat like this year mm -hmm. that was pretty cool to see yeah that is cool mm -hmm. um I guess for me uh same sort of thing like always being underestimated because I was fat when I went to do sports or anything um and so that was something that my character <laughs> received a lot of underestimation from her competitors and from and from other people. But um, for for me personally, I was raised in a, a very conservative Christian home. My grandfather was a pastor of a Southern Baptist church, mm. and um, we used to we used to have a lot of food shaming, which was very confusing because eating food was something that the community and families would do together. So but the prayers would be things like, Lord bless this food, but not to our, but Lord bless this food to our bodies, but not literally, that would be literally the prayer <laughs> or, you know, on, on prayer groups or, or women's groups, they would do weight watchers and, and weigh themselves. And it was like this culture of the church. So part of me wanted to kind of include that my main character's dad is a pastor, this kind of culture of like, you never feel okay in your body, which is, which is a weird thing. Um, 
from from a religion that says your God loves you no matter what. Um, there's a lot of shaming women and, and body sizes there. So part of part of that was me just processing that time of my life and that chapter of my life and how it felt to try to prove myself despite the, the people who were supposed to support me, making me feel like I was not good enough. And the people who I was trying to prove myself against making me feel like I was not good enough. And that always like that pressure to always, always be on, like Kelly was saying. So I think those, those things translated the most into my story. Hey, I think um, with mine, the things that I brought into it from my own past was, I think, uh, you know, I was a fat athlete. I played basketball in school. And then in high school, I really, um, you know, because I also grew up in the 90s and uh, in South Florida. And so the rave scene was really big back then. And so I got into dancing and I would go dancing four nights a week. And I think in the beginning of that, I was always afraid and I would dance in the deepest, darkest shadows of the club because I thought that people would be judging me. Like, why are you out here dancing, you know, in the body that you're in? And um, I found that uh, I really developed a strong sense of confidence the more that I did it. And all of a sudden I didn't care who was watching. And, you know, I, I ran with a group of break dancers. And so I was doing things that people don't necessarily assume people in fat bodies can do. And I really just, that's when my confidence blossomed. And so what I wanted to impart into my story, because my, uh, uh, main character is also a dancer is that you can't wait for tomorrow you're never guaranteed tomorrow and so regardless of what your body because we all have bodies that have changed over the years I don't think anyone is ever static in their size and regardless of that you can't wait for a size you may never become to start living your life uh -huh. especially because you may never get that next day um, so do the things that bring you joy today mm -hmm. in the size that you're in and, and, and try, at least try for what you want to do. Um, and so that's, that's what I brought into mind that and the accident too, because that's yeah. something that actually happened to me, <laughs> which is also another reason why I always say, you know, I could have very easily died when the van hit me. I didn't, I'm very thankful for that. Um, but if you don't attempt things that scare you because of judgment from yourself or those without you'll never live the life that yeah. you deserve and then you're gonna wake up one day and be like I gave up so much on 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 something that never happened to me uh -huh. um, so that you know that's really what I wanted to put into the world with my story um I I will say, you know, we have been getting some amazing reviews on our book as a whole. Um, there are some that point out that our antho anthology has characters in almost every story who are fat phobic. Um, I know my reason for that uh, for myself is because, because I think that the person in, in my story who is most fat phobic is probably herself. You know, she's dealing with internalized issues from the world around her and she's coming to terms with it and because I really wanted to make it real <laughs> we live in a world where this is the you know daily life for some people um were there any particular reasons that any of you included them in your story for me I didn't like seek out to write <clears throat> fat phobia into my story it's just such a natural part of life as a fat person like you can't go a day without seeing it or having it directed at you um that it trickled into this to the story um yeah if I think like if you're writing a fantasy world you have the ability to recreate the world to be however you want to be inclusive um uh but in a real world, it's not like that. And I really wanted teen readers especially to realize that despite the systemic injustice they're about to face, that they do have the power and they have every right to do it too. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, for me, a lot of the, the fat phobia was really the mom that's directed at the daughter. And a lot of times moms see themselves and their daughters, right? Mm -hmm. So then when Renee is being like, you know, you 
want to try salad. You know what I mean? It's it's one of those things where Renee isn't, she doesn't think what she's doing is really hurting Ryan. She, in her way, thinks it's helping her, right? And that's how a lot of people come at you in the real world. So they're like, mm, are you sure you should eat that? You know what uh-huh. I mean? And then I look at them and I'll be like, are you sure you should be in my mouth? Because nobody asked you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, but see, I've always kind of, you know, been like that. So then at, you know, at a certain point, nobody challenges me, you know, when it comes to kind of what I do. But it was because like, I would have those types of instances where people thought that they were helping and what they were really doing was criticizing and kind of showing mm-hmm. how, um, you know, they were kind of scared at, at how, you know, um, they were being reflected in v- vis-a-vis their children. You know, Renee is just like, you girls are a reflection of me. Therefore, this is what I feel you should look like, or this is what I feel you should represent. And a lot of moms do that with their daughters. Daughters don't have to be fat, right? So okay. their, their daughters can be, you know, too tall. Their daughters can be, you know, LGBTQIA+. And you no, know, no, 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 no. This is a reflection of me. You're a reflection of me. And, and this is the narrow kind of pathway that I've set for you. So that's what I wanted to show. Um, and also, you know, because, you know, in African-American communities, you know, heart disease, diabetes, all of these things really kind of come into play. So you know, when you have Renee, she's thinking like she's helping Orion and, and, and her way, but, you know, she's really hurting. And that's what happens to a lot of families. I mean, like, I understand, you know, that, you know, fat phobia and, you know, people may not want to read that in stories, but like, we're in the real world. This is what we really tend to deal with. And I mean, mm-hmm. you need something to push against and to overcome. And this is what we all push against and what mm-hmm. we overcome. So I wouldn't look at it as like all of these, you know, if I look at the triumph and look at what mm-hmm. is being done, like look at the end result of all of these naysayers and look at what the character in and of himself, herself, themselves have accomplished. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess I always feel like when you're undertaking storytelling with fat characters, you always have to make some kind of a choice about to what degree you're going to address fat phobia. I mean, because it's like, I feel like I touched on it very, very lightly in my story. And simply because I felt like it, I think there's just like a couple lines in the very beginning about some dad that's, that critiques my softball player, Haley. And I just felt that like, I do think that fat athletes do get a lot of criticism of their bodies and so forth. And it just simply wasn't realistic to just not ever address it. But it becomes like, I always feel like it's this big challenge of what are you going to show people? Are you going to show people the world that it is as it is, or as it, you know, possibly could be and I think it's winds up being really difficult because like if you don't show someone the bridge between the world as it exists right now and the world as if we wish it could exist then how do they get from where we are right now to where we need to be I mean if you just are like oh and now here's a completely different world where everybody is just nice all the time to fat people it's like well all right (laughs) but how how do you get there you know I mean and in the meantime while we're still stuck in this world how do you deal with the things that are actually happening in my story it was a bit of a challenge because Jeannie she's in like it's written expository oh my god epistolary epistolary Epistolary. there you go I could see the word my mind went blank (laughs) I was like about about, (laughs) anyways um it's epistolary so it's all in letters and the main problem with Jeannie is she's very self-centered and (laughs) am I telling on myself (laughs) but because she's so self-centered um a big issue with fat phobia in the book is that or in her story specifically is that she does she's mostly fat phobic against herself she internalizes a lot of things but also she's kind of like she has this exoskeleton where the world is concerned. You can tell she does not, (laughs) you can tell that she does not really pay attention to other people or what other people are going through specifically. She kind of archetypes people and she's very almost analytical about how she sees people. And while it's funny, it's very like her and the world are separate. And 
when fat phobia does seep into it, it's her and her reflection on kind of herself. It's in, I almost want to say, I didn't think that I had fat phobia in the story until I was doing a run through of it. And there was a moment where I looked and I was like, oh, wow, yeah, there it is. And it's that moment where you don't realize you're being fat phobic against yourself because it's this little critique that you have or this little thought that you have. And I was like, yeah, there we go. Thanks for teaching me that. <laughs> it's right there. And, you know, like it's, it's, I felt like a, um, as far as including like an actual antagonist or a physical one in the story outside of the odd comment that her boyfriend makes, which, you know, it's up in the air. Was he being like that about her or was he, was it, was it her interpretation? Cause she's, you know, again, not somebody who takes other people into consideration. Um, it was, it was, I guess, just more of a, a relatable thing or eye open thing of how we view the world, not to say that she has no reason to view the world this way, all of the media that we are inundated with and all of the, the ideas and everything that society throws at us is constantly feeding us this idea, but the way that she kind of throws it back on herself and morphs it and the way that it just, it just is within her without even a second thought or without even like a, a long continuous like, hmm, this is fat phobia, this is how it makes me feel. I felt like it was just so realistic to me because if I can say the one thing, I never, hmm, outside of my mom, who is kind of has a willow frame and my family who's like diabetes and then nobody has diabetes in the family and there are lots of people who are overweight in the family. <laughs> outside of them, um, I've never actually dealt with like aggressive fat phobia that's very antagonistic from others. I've dealt with the subtle kind and the microaggressions with it. And of course, media and society. And so I was never able to pinpoint or have a moment where I'm like, I, you know, it's when you, you feel like, do I get to complain about this? Because no one else, no one said, hey, fatty, while I was walking down the street trying to like, you know, go to the store or something. So do I really get to complain? Do I get to feel like this? Isn't it just a me thing? You know, you, you start to think things like that, which are just as damaging as someone literally saying it because you're the someone who's saying it. And so I think like for me, having her be like that, and it, it's not innocent the way that it happens in the book, but the way she just kind of you know, she's going about her life and then here's some fat phobia in here, how I view myself and the way that I think and how I compare myself to a girl that I think looks drastically different than me and how this girl is looking at me and she's saying that I'm beautiful. Like, <gasps> I didn't realize that. I didn't actually think that. And for the, for the fact that I would even look at, at somebody else and be like, do you wish I looked as beautiful as her? The way that she's comparing herself, I'm just like, if that's so damaging and yeah, so the answer to the question, she's her own antagonist. <laughs> Long way to <laughs> I, I find it surprising, sorry, how many people are shocked that there's fat phobia in stories about fat people. Like, would they be shocked about ableism and stories about disabled people? Like, it's just, it's kind of weird to me. Well, I think it just proves the point that there's not enough stories out there already mm -hmm. for them to find that, or they are either... I think bothered because it hits home too much. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, Sometimes people be in their emotions. They read yeah. something mm -hmm. at the wrong time. Is, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. yep. yeah, And 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 also, or they've never felt it, and so they. What, what's the best kind of word to use it? They take offense on behalf of fat people. I think if they're not fat, and therefore they're really offended. But what they don't realize, perhaps, is that these are everyday occurrences to fat mm -hmm. people. And so these are experiences that in a way we want to relate to because then we know we're not alone. Um, yeah, I think. Go on. Oh, I was going to, are you sure? You're not done? I'm really bad at interrupting. I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> okay. I was just going to say, um, like, I think it's important to show fat phobia from the point of view of the victim because too often we see it as like, we make a joke at a fat character and then that fat character goes on and the main characters keep doing their life. But these are like characters who have to live with the consequences of those jokes or those systems that are oppressing them, you know? So like, I think it's, it's interesting to see all the different stories in the anthology because they all have different worldviews and they all express that differently. And I, I found that, yeah, some of them are really hard to read, but I think they still are really important. 
And I also think that the one underlying theme and the magic of this anthology and something that I love to say as much as possible is that while all of our characters have something coming at them from something they care about, um, typically uh, when you get those funny fat friend stories or sidekick or joke stories, they always have that character change themselves to fit the narrative. Mm -hmm. However, we have 16 entire stories where they make the narrative change to fit them. And that's the power of each story and the magic of the book. You know, they are not changing to fit society's view of fat bodies. They're mm -hmm. saying, come into my world and change your mind to fit my view, um, mm -hmm. to be a part of my journey. Uh -huh. uh, in different ways. And, and, and so I think, you know, 16 fabulous stories, they are fabulous, but they're not everybody just having parties, <laughs> you know, and, like it's, it's real world stuff. And I think that is needed um, to be read by people of all shapes and sizes, honestly. Um, I have to say, I'm not shocked at all, actually, that people were maybe bothered by the fat phobia in it because I one thing that I do find is whenever you're t representing a marginalized or disserviced community I notice that whether the people themselves are part of that marginalization or whether they consider themselves allies they all like there's kind of this idea that what should be presented should not be what's realistic to this person or we don't want to see how this person struggles per se we want to see us feel good about this person. And oftentimes I'm like, okay, but you you have to first comprehend and have compassion for the person and their struggles before you can have the feel good of what it is that they're going through. Otherwise uh -huh. there's there's no ground, there's no ground for you to, to even like stand on or to link the bridge. It's like, oh, we just want to see a fat person. It, or actually, you know what? That's not true. It's either we want to see something completely in the trauma field so that we can kind of get this trauma experience and this, oh, I feel good about myself because I don't treat people this way. Or we want to get a complete feel good that I can self-insert myself into, self-insert myself, that I can self-insert into and have an experience that is great dandelions and all good because if I have to think about the actual nuances of what's going on, that's uncomfortable for me, just like it is uncomfortable for me to think about the nuances of how this exists in the world. And that uncomfortability is usually when I see, usually anytime I see someone who's like, oh, this is a tackling this, or you know, I didn't enjoy this aspect of this, that, or the other. I'm like, you're really showing right now how uncomfortable you are with how this actually is in society. And the mm -hmm. fact that you don't wanna to have to deal with your own biases, you don't wanna to have to deal with the way that you behave or how others behave around you. You just want it to be all better. You either want to feel good about the fact that you don't do it, or you wanna feel better because you have the guilt that you actually don't advocate that, or that for yourself, or for others. So I'm just always like the tea, the tea says you spilling it right now. <laughs> no, I mean, it's really like a very superficial form of allyship, right? Mm. So it's just one of those things like, you know, when you talk about BLM and people are just like, oh, well, like I'm not that Karen. I don't, I don't do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then like at the same time, I'm walking by with my brother who's six foot eight and you'll clutch your purse, right? Or, um, you know, in terms of, you know, like fat phobia, you know what I'm saying? You'll just be like, oh, I would never call anybody fat to their face, but you will body check mm. like real quick, fast and in a hurry, you know, like, uh oh, oh, you're, you're sitting next to me on the plane. Yes, I will not suffocate you. Everything is fine. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just very much a superficial form of, of allyship. You know, it's, it's almost like, you want us to make you feel better about your BS. Mm -hmm. And that's not, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not why yeah. I'm here, poo poo. That's not, that's not why I wrote this story. So you need to get yourself right. And, and then, you know, reread the story and then come to. Now, everybody is entitled to an opinion. Opinions are like elbows. Everybody's got them, mm -hmm. right? But the thing is, look at the motive and the base of where your opinion is coming from. You know what I mean? If you're just like, I don't like it because it doesn't make me feel. What about right. it triggering mm. you? Mm. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Is it the fact that you've experienced this or you've perpetrated this? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, and, and you know, in some way, shape, or form. And then, you know, but the thing, you don't want to explore that. So then you're just like, there's just like a lot of fat phobia. And I just, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really want to deal with that. You know what I mean? You know, because you don't want to deal with how you may have latently or blatantly contributed to, mm-hmm. you know, you know, fat phobia, transphobia, racism, whatever it is. You know what I mean? People like to examine other people in stories. People hate to self-examine. Yeah. 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 Especially for in, I feel I feel it first person perspective, especially because usually uh-huh. first person narratives always get the biggest hit, especially with their female first person mm-hmm. or any type of marginalization after that. It's always I wanted to insert myself, and you're asking me to examine because this person has flaws, and no, I'm not with it. I'm not with these flaws because I have these flaws probably, and that's why I'm triggered right now. And end. I don't like I don't like. I don't like how you showing me myself. <laughs> and we also much. think it's kind of fascinating, like just the sheer volume of complaints that get directed against fat female characters of the unlikable character. Like the unlikable female character is always like a thing anyway that we're always kind of trying to fight against as writers. But I just feel like that is especially a problem when you start writing a female character that is fat. Like the percentage of people that will declare that character unlikable, just even when they're doing basic things, just like advocating for themselves or, you know, or arguing with somebody, you know, it's like in real life people have arguments and it's like two things people having an argument I guess it's two people having an argument and a fat person and a thin person having an argument is an unlikable person <laughs> you know I mean so it's like I, uh-huh. I just think that that's kind of like interesting too it's I mean I, I really do think in some of these reviews people are revealing more about themselves uh-huh. than they are about the book yeah, yeah. once again yeah. it's about assertion confidence uh-huh. Uh-huh. when they uh-huh. fat people portraying these things it's like I said I'm going back to the whole well, how how dare you? How dare you kick against the pricks? Hey, you understand that, Rebecca, being another pastor <laughs> of the New Testament. Um, but just, you know, just, you know, just having the confidence to say, no, I'm not going to accept this. No, mm-hmm. I don't think this is right. And it's like, well, like, who are you to say? Because you don't fit this particular, you know, this normal size, normal shape, normal look, normal this, normal that. Normal is just such a dumb word. <laughs> Fat people are normal. The average yeah. North American is size 16, 18. That's normal. Yeah, I know. I'm very normal. I we are normal. <laughs> we are so normal right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, our sizes are normal. We might not be normal mm-hmm. in other yeah, ways. Yeah, we're, we're normal. <laughs> <with us. laughs> like, like we're talking mental. We talk like physically. <laughs> like mentally, that's a whole nother. That's a whole nother. Mm-hmm. That's a whole nother panel. That's, that's yeah. Um, what is the difference to you when it comes to body positivity and fat acceptance? I feel like Kelly really hit on it earlier with its advocacy. It's advocacy either for yourself or for others. Um, Because as like Rebecca said earlier too, the whole like, I accept myself because I have cellulite. And it's like, that's great. Body positivity. It's all about Uh you. Be positive about your body, but fat acceptance. I feel like it's a whole different. Also, I kind of feel like "Mm, it's a whole different thing because are you really accepting yourself? If uh, it's like, it's a slippery slope. I'm positive because I've got roles and I, you know, I'm, I love my stretch marks. And it's like, well, if you were accepting, just like you're accepting of I don't know, any other feature on your body that has nothing to do with the beauty standard. So you never talk about it ever, your kneecaps. Like if you were actually <laughs> accepting, would you have to talk about it? Would you have to be positive about it? And so it's like, I think body positivity can lead to fat acceptance, but I also think that it can be counterintuitive to it as well, because uh-huh. you're, you're constantly talking about it instead of just accepting it. Um, uh-huh. So it's like, it's a slippery, it's a double-edged sword. It's like, you know, you, you, in my opinion, I think. Mm-hmm. It's hard because a lot of like thinner people are taking over the body positivity movement and the body positivity movement was originally created by fat black women to focus on anti-racism work, 
um, disability justice, fat liberation, and trans rights, but it's been co-opted to I love myself, which I get because like every single woman experiences misogyny and every single woman and woman aligning person is told their body is not good enough, right? But the difference is fat people also experience systemic injustice that is killing us, right? That is letting us be fired from our jobs. That's not giving us health insurance, that sort of stuff. So like, if you really care about feminism, which is everybody's equal, then you have to care about fat liberation. Like that liberates all women, all women aligned people, all people, right? So that's why a little bit bugs me that body positivity has been kind of co-opted for, I love what my body looks like despite flaws. Um, because it's well, so, it it's so much like more marketing resource too, exactly. Like, mm. which kind of points to like one of the biggest issues, which is that like a lot of the big achievements in fat acceptance or fat positivity or body positivity or whatever kind of terminology that you want to use has been like mostly consumerist, you know, mm. like it's been like in fashion, it's been like, you know, like it's been in things for sale, like corporate America figured out fat people have money. And so they started using all this terminology <laughs> to like get money and sell products, which is fine, but it didn't really like come along with any corresponding acknowledgement of like, okay, well, fat people also need quality medical care. You all, mm -hmm. you know, you also need to be able to go to the doctor and like complain that you cut your finger off and then not say, oh, but did you have a finger? Cause I've noticed you're fat, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's like, it just didn't, I, I feel like, you know, when you start allowing marketing departments to take over all of this stuff, a lot of what is actually important in fat acceptance or fat positivity gets lost. I mean, but see, that always happens. That happens mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, uh, Black History, you know, like Black History Month of February, you would not have a bunch of commercials. We stand, BLM. <laughs> now go ahead and buy these Frito-Lay chips. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Frito-Lay is probably treating their Black and Poet employees horribly. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm still getting paid, like, what, 65 cents? We get paid 65 cents on a dollar, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's just one of those, you know, like I said, once again, superficial allyship. I should probably mm -hmm. get that trademark. But, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, I mean, that's why it's, it's essentially, okay, a bumper sticker. That's essentially what it is and, and what we're dealing with. And I mean... This isn't the first time, nor will it be the last, that Black women start something and then everybody else yeah. takes it over and acts like, you know, they created it. Like, who is it, Kim Kardashian with cornrows? Like, half a, mm -hmm. but how did that, we've been doing that forever. But I mean, like, this is, this is you know, kind of what always. Yeah, yeah but that's a happen. really interesting question for me personally, because, you know, obviously I'm a white person, but for a lot of us- No! <laughs> It's an announcement. I'm announcing it now. <laughs> but, you know, culturally, like a lot of times the first time we see a role model, a fat role model, it is a black woman, you know, like I remember for me as a little kid, like the first time I saw somebody where I really thought like, oh my gosh, just like kind of embracing their size. I think it was um, in that movie, Waiting to Exhale. My mom made me go there. Loretta you know, Devine. Mm -hmm. Loretta Devine, yeah. And it's like, you know, she was this person that like expected to be treated like an attractive woman, you know? And and I just thought like, oh my, oh my gosh, you know, like that's really eye-opening. And, and then, you know, even though now, like you guys address the thing with Lizzo, of course, and I always find like, what, what is the, like, what is the way to not be a superficial ally? If that's an okay question to pose, I guess, because like, you know, ulti ultimately it's like a lot of the stuff does get co-opted and then the face of it becomes very white and very like hourglass figure-ish and so on and so forth. And I always kind of try and figure out like what, what's the way around, around it. What's, what's the way forward? You know, I mean, I've actually, oh. No, 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 go, 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 oh. go. I've actually been having so many conversations about this lately um, on Twitter. <laughs> I, I'm laughing because <laughs> it's such a sex fool, but there I am. Um, there's a big conversation about AAVE and like many non-Blacks are saying it's not a language and Blacks saying, 
No, the slang that you hear us use comes from AAVE, but AAVE is something different that you've probably never actually heard. Like some of us who speak Gullah, <laughs> some of us, like, you know, if you've ever been to the country and you've actually heard Black people speak AAVE, you probably would have no idea what's going on. It's like, so the slang that you've co-opted or bits and pieces of what you've taken isn't AAVE it's like that's just part of part of our AAVE and like and now you're just you're making it into a subculture now which everybody participates in which decenters black people and so it's okay. like the whole idea is that for me at least is that when it comes to appreciation versus appropriation and then a harvesting of something and a decentering and then kicking out their original culture who well black women who are starting something okay. I think it's so difficult because it's so nuanced. We all have to first acknowledge the white supremacy in all of us uh -huh. based off of the fact that colonization happened and it happened by a whole systematic thing. And so each and every single one of us has all of these different levels of illusions of what we think the world is based off of that whole system. And because all of it's sick, there's almost no way that you can appreciate without appropriating based on this whole system until the whole thing is dismantled, which almost makes it like, well, well, damn, what do we do? We're damned if we do, damned if we don't. And I think it's kind of this, this place where once you start dismantling, we all start shifting into a place where we can appreciate things without taking it on. Because like I, I was having this whole conversation, I was like Black people and especially Black women are the only culture that gets, that gets subcultured and then ejected out of our own culture. So for instance, actually the black, the body, the body positivity movement, you have an entire body structure that is iconically of the black woman and saying, this is what we look like. We're not skinny. We have a, a booty. <laughs> We're not so skinny. <laughs> we have butt and we have these and breast and we, you know, like, and we come in different shapes and sizes with it, but we are curvy people. And then no one really acknowledges it until Kim Kardashians, the Kardashians themselves come out and pay for the same body. And then it becomes the Kardashian body. And then you like look up and you're like, oh, oh my God, are they, are they literally black facing? <laughs> like, like, is this, no, is for this real. the black thing? Like, black like, thing? Yeah, like we know yeah. what you did at the doggone corn, you know what you just like, these are about to yeah. like, no chick, these are corn rolls. Yeah, first of all, yeah, first of all, the these. style's not the same. Yeah, get your styles you know, right. <laughs> what you're not gonna do is call them box because that's not what this is. You know, and then like not only will they appropriate. They will mess it up, and you're like, "That's not what any of this is." Yeah, and, and like, and I'm, oh, go no, ahead. No, no. Oh, uh, and then also, it's it's kind of one of those things like being an ally. I think some people think that allyship has a destination. It has a start and it has a destination. It's a constant, consistent thing. It's ever yeah. evolving. It's these questions you're going to have to constantly ask yourself. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. with your interactions with people of color with trans you know like you know like uh lgbt right i'm a cisgendered african-american woman she her her these are my pronouns so i have to when i'm constantly. being an ally you know to to the lgbtqia plus community i have to constantly ask myself you know or put questions before myself to make sure i'm not misgendering um unintentionally offending you know what i mean and i'm not saying it's easy but it's necessary. And the thing is, you can't, you can't fix a diseased system, right? Like it's mm -hmm. just, it's just, yeah, it's all trash. The whole system yeah. needs to and go in the trash can. Trash. You literally just need to build something new from the ground up. You don't try to save a tree where there's like a disease in the trunk. You got to cut that bro down. You got to plant a new tree. You know what I'm saying? This is from somebody who don't know nature, but I know you can plant a new tree. That's essentially what you have to do in terms of allyship. And then also, like I said, you just have to constantly be in that mindset when you're dealing with people outside of, you know, like, okay, I'm a white woman and I'm dealing with white people. Like you have to constantly kind of go outside of that comfort zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a lot of, of decentering yourself from an total narrative while centering yourself personally. And also like, cause I'm like, I've noticed a shift where saying like, I'm white, 
was weird years ago. That's not something you would say. You wouldn't bring up race. It's, it's not proper. It's really uncomfortable. Or if someone brings up, yeah, you're white or, you know, the white girl over there, it feels offensive. And it's like for marginalized people, it's like, well, welcome to the party. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's a descriptor. You're fine. And I think it's getting used to, and I mean, and knowing that like the things that I've had to like the decolonization that I've had to go through, it's very uncomfortable because I've had to go through so many on so many different levels when it comes to queer community, when it comes to my own blackness, when it comes to whiteness, when it comes to all sorts of things, um, being able body, um, anything like that. I've had to decolonize so many different uh, thoughts and it is always uncomfortable. It's never comfortable. And I think it's getting comfortable being uncomfortable, being able to laugh at yourself, being like, I like my main phrase is I'm always like, I'm a dumb bee. <laughs> like, except, like I, I choose to accept that I know nothing. And so therefore I'm always learning everything. And I'm always quick to be like, you know, dang, I didn't know that was a thing. It makes no sense to me, but it also doesn't need to make sense to me. I just need to be aware that this exists over here. And because I'm curious about it, that doesn't mean it's mine or I get to take it on or I get to make it a part of me in my curiosity. And I feel like sometimes that's a big issue when that's where the appreciation crawls into appropriation is when you're so interested in something or you want to be a part of something. And so somehow it becomes part of your personality without it being part of your story. And, oh, that was annoying. That's a good line. That's a good line. <laughs> write it down. Write it down. Write it down before you forget it. <laughs> I know. I need to. We're all going to write tell it down. It's going to be, no, <laughs> gonna be the second bumper sticker in the line. Yes, yeah, hello. I know. We're gonna but I think it's like. like I know that's where it boils down to and it's like there's no easy way there's no easy solution the whole thing is sick so you first of all you just have to get used to being like I'm sick <laughs> we're all sick so we're all going to step on each other's toes it's all going to be uncomfortable but I'm going to move from a place instead of trying to comprehend everything I'm going to have compassion for everything first like I don't have to understand I'm just going to have the compassion and like let you do you focus on doing me. Cause like, again, if I'm so obsessed with trying to center in something that isn't like that's, so that's a signal that I feel like I'm missing something myself. If I'm centering in something in a storyline that has nothing to do with me, if I'm centering on experiences that aren't mine, it's like, why don't I value my own experience? Why don't I, why am I not centering on my own storyline? And I think a lot of it comes from guilt. A lot of it comes from many different aspects and things. And like Catherine said, you, we, gotta, you, we gotta start asking ourselves those questions so we can get those answers. And that's, I think naturally you get into a space where you can appreciate because you also appreciate yourself without it being like an inflated thing. Like I appreciate who I am, damn. So I also appreciate who she is. Wow, this is like, this is good energy. Wow, now I can be inspired because I'm adding something to my storyline. I'm not just taking someone else's story and being like, well, this is my new personality, Kim Kardashian. Oh my goodness. I woke <laughs> up one day and I was like, not only does she have a black, <laughs> I was like, I, th I think I'm seeing, I'm seeing some, some weirdness here because people are now, a body that I had and I grew up with was completely shamed to the point of I had body dysmorphia. And now I'm seeing a woman who bought this body and everyone's like, this is her body. And we've seen it with sites like um, Plus Size Fashion with Fashion Nova, where they used to have black models with black bodies. And now they have white models with store-bought bodies to sell to black women who mostly have those bodies in that specific type of range. And it's just, it's very weird. It's very odd. It's a matrix that I don't want to be a part of anymore. <laughs> But I think that's where it just comes from is asking those questions to the self. Yeah. Yeah. I, to bring our conversation a little bit into Kidlet, um, my next uh, question is going to be what advice would you give young readers, especially thin, able bodied ones, to help them be better allies to folks with bigger bodies? And what advice would you give to fat teens? For me, when it comes to the thin reader, 
think about how you want somebody to treat you, right? So it's the golden rule. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. Not saying that it's easy, but if you constantly put yourself in a state of mind is, if I said, if somebody said this to me, how would I feel? Or if somebody did this to me, how would I feel? And if the answer is not good, then you know not to do it. So just put that question before yourself. When it comes to, you know, um, our fat leaders, it's, it's one of those things where, and I know it's two words, but it's a big ask. Love yourself. Look in the mirror and love yourself. Love everything about you. Love your body. Love your mind. Love the fact that you're funny. Love the fact that you can be kind. You know what I mean? And don't hold on to the bitterness of people not realizing how awesome and wonderful you are. That's kind of something that I had to learn to let go because some of the chicks that I had to deal with when I was younger, and I still have to learn, like if I would like 10 years ago, if I saw them on the street, I might not be talking to you now because I might be in jail. But like I'm I'm trying to to learn to let that bitterness go. So don't don't become bitter because that's a hard thing to 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 let go. People won't treat you good all the time, but the thing is, that's on them, that's their loss. And that's what you kind of have to understand. Just once again, two words with a very big ask. Love yourself. For me, I would try to encourage um, ally readers to actually have books written by fat people with fat main characters on their shelf. Um, a lot of people say they care about diversity, but when you look at their bookshelves, it's pretty thin. Um, so that's the number one thing I would do, I would suggest. And buying books by, with fat main characters tells publishing that there is a readership for it. And like follow authors who are fat and like their posts, share them, like boost, boost them as much as you want. Go, go to the source and boost the source as much as you can. Use your platform and your privilege to, um, to help them out. And for fat teens, um, like Catherine said, you matter. You matter today. You, you are de deserving of dignity and respect in the body you have today. You are worthy of living your life to the fullest in the body you have today. You don't have to change despite what the outside voices are telling you. You're perfectly fine the way you are. And if it's too hard to love yourself, that's okay. Try to get to body neutrality. Not everybody can love themselves. Not everybody can love their bodies, but it's, it's, it's totally um, doable to get to a place of neutrality with your body. Well, I just wanted to build on what Catherine said, and which is, I think that, you know, love yourself and definitely, but I also feel like a lot of what is great about stories about fat people is that they represent strategies to advocate for yourself, mm -hmm. which I think is really, really important. And that's like, one of the things that I like about our anthology is that like it is a lot of characters going through kind of finding that finding ways to advocate for themselves in in their lives and I, I think that like that's kind of is always like what I'm thinking when I'm writing a fat character is like could I show a template to somebody of like here's how how you deal with fat phobia in your life or here's how you deal with certain situations in your life I would say my question to thin bodies would be, or I, su I guess the one thing I would say is reflect on why the idea of being fat bothers you. Because I think when we can have people dismantling the idea of fatness in their own mind, because I, I did see somebody mention before that fat phobia is also the idea that you don't want to get fat, you need to lose weight. Like that inherently is fat phobic, it's fat phobic inside of you. Now, I'm not saying that you can't, you know, <laughs> want to maintain a certain lifestyle, a certain weight, a certain whatever. I think the thing is, is just to know and to be more aware of the illusion behind body size and the fact that none of that matters none of it matters none of it's real morty you know like you can have no, you, did. <laughs> <I did. laughs> you can have whatever body it is that you want and i think this would be more directed towards fat teens is it's your body you can do whatever you want with it if you want to lose weight because you want to like do something that requires you 
to, I guess, feel a certain way. I don't know. I don't know. Do whatever you want. Like if you want to walk like a thousand miles and run a marathon and do a triathlon, become an Olympian, by all means, like obviously all that exercise, you're going to be burning off all the fat. So do whatever it is you want. If you want to be the way that you are, be the way that you are. Like recognize that your body is literally just an extension of you. Like one, you aren't your body technically. Like you're living in the mind space. Me again with my Rick and Morty. None of it's real. No, but like you, you, you don't, your body is just, it's a temple. It's your home. Decorate it. Take care of it. However it is that you feel necessary and what that means for you, body sovereignty. Um, I like, I heard that word. Oh my God. Now I have to find out who said that word. I'm so sorry. It was oh, Alex Dino, I think. Alex, yes, yes, yes. Alex with body sovereignty and like, they just rep, they said it in such a poetic way, which is, it's my body. I get to do what I want with it. Stay out of my business, stay out of my bag. It's my body. And I just want fat teens to realize that because I feel like a lot of us feel when we are fat phobic internally, or when we feeling pressure, or when we're not advocating for ourselves, it's because inherently we feel like our body belongs to society and we're trying to appease somebody or something outside of it even when we think we're just trying to appease ourselves. It's like, if, if you don't have a real reason of why you were like, mm, I don't know about this with my body. For instance, I'm bloated today. That makes me feel uncomfortable because what did I eat? You know, because I am inherently uncomfortable because maybe I'm gluten, <laughs> I have gluten allergies. That's one thing, but looking in the mirror and being like, ew, is totally different. And that ain't it. You know what I mean? So like, it's, it goes to what Catherine's saying, which is love yourself but also just like recognize like y'all it's, it's like a car you know what I mean like do what you want it's a cool car take care of it you only get one really I mean I wouldn't chance it on getting a new one so <laughs> just like love it and nourish it and you know appease yourself not others yeah I I, I think my advice um to thin able-bodied uh readers would be um you know, just surround yourself with bodies all of all shapes and sizes, you know, diversify your friend group. <laughs> it, the more that you get to live in someone else's shoes, the more the world feels like we all belong. And it's just so much easier that way to really understand a human by not hiding yourself away from those experiences and um you know reach out to those around you who you know even 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 if you're uncomfortable with conversations you know have the conversations include your friends and don't automatically assume that they're not going to want to go and you know run a mile with you or <laughs> you know go take them to uh you know if you're going shopping take them to inclusive stores and 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 all these tiny little things that show that you're thinking of them as well especially as you become teens if you go out to eat maybe be the one who looks out for your friend to make sure that the seating is comfortable for everyone so that way they're not there thinking to themselves in their head this chair sucks really bad but I don't want to make a fuss or you know put the spotlight on myself be that ally for them in that way um the advice that I would give to fat teens you all deserve your hero or heroine story you deserve to be the main character of your journey don't ever let anybody tell you different um you know enjoy the ride from start to finish you get one one <laughs> maybe i mean who knows maybe we get reincarnated i really don't know but <laughs> but just in case like um it, it be the, the the reader and the person that you always wanted to be don't live vicariously through someone else or someone else's story um before we get to uh, the questions from the audience, because I know we're going to have to wrap it up, one thing that I always love asking you guys is, um, who do you hope your stories will reach, and who or and what do you hope that readers will get out of the Everybody Shines anthology? That's a hard question, Cass. 
<laughs> I thought it was going to be like two seconds. Like, oh. okay, I'll say I hope my story reaches everybody, and I hope what they get out of it is expansion. Because when you expand the mind, you expand. I don't know. The, I, I'm trying to be poetic. <laughs> you, you know, just like when you expand your mind, you expand your horizons, and you become a more compassionate and more well-rounded person. Are we allowed uh, to say Oprah so that we can be in the Oprah book club? Please yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Throw that out there for oh, us. Yo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Or the I, I Way book club would be awesome. Just throw that <laughs> one out there. Megan Rapinoe started a book club. Shoot, I was just saying. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope, you know, like Francine, I hope my story reaches everybody, but in particular, I hope it reaches Black girls who feel like what they want is too big. Mm -hmm. What you want isn't too big. What you want is what you want. Go get it. <laughs> and I hope that, uh, you know, that everybody shines anthology in and of itself reaches people of, of all ages, all shapes and sizes, and more importantly, makes you ask the question, you know, am I shining? Am I helping other people to shine? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what I hope. Uh, for me, I hope basically everything those girls said, but I, I hope that it reaches people who haven't seen themselves in stories or, or bodies like theirs in stories. And then, and then they realize that their, their story is worthy. Their story is worthy of a, a fairy tale or a romance or an adventure. Um, and yeah. While you are all putting those out there, I'm going to say <laughs> I could... I'll be happy for it to reach Reese's book club and maybe <laughs> <laughs> Lizzo and her um, TikTok account or Instagram <laughs> while we're just putting yeah, that out there. Yes, yes. But I think for myself, I hope that my story reaches those who still dance in the dark that are afraid to shine in the spotlight. Go be out in the spotlight. Enjoy it. Soak it up. It's a fun place to be. Um, and I hope that readers get to be able to experience body neutrality and a deeper connection with themselves through um, the stories that they find in our collection. And did you, did you answer Francina? I'm not sure. Oh yeah, I did. Okay. 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 Well, um, I think, uh, we are coming up on time. So Anne. Uh, we are, yes, my gosh. Oh, I, 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 I know it went by so quickly, didn't it? I wish we could just keep mm -hmm. going forever. I, I feel like the five of you um, have talked about really some amazing things tonight. And we did have a couple of questions from the audience. So I'm gonna take us back into a little bit of the meaty, meaty bet for a moment. The question was, why are you using body positivity, which is a whitewashed, thin, co-opted version of fat liberation? And you've kind of addressed the, you know, I like I hadn't really thought about that myself. And you've kind of talked about how that had been happening. And so I wanted to kind of add on to that, the whole concept of the idea of terminology and how it, it changes so quickly and you know, it can be really confusing to try to know, you know, what are the right words to use? How do we know what to say and what's accepted? So maybe you could talk about that a little bit, um, you know, how to really how to keep up with um, what what people want, what words matter. So we want to make sure that we use the right words. I think and correct me if I'm wrong, any of you guys, but I think that right now with the youth of today, body positivity is something that they experience throughout their social media, their, their, you know, mm -hmm. words that they see all the time. And I think that while our collection of stories encompasses so much more than bo body positivity, I think that those, um, that, that phrase in itself can bring people in and open their eyes to fat acceptance and um, give them, you know, the tools to understanding um, body neutrality and, and how to deal with internalized fat phobia. And also um, that there's so much more to it. And, you know, as everyone has said, you know, getting proper health care, securing jobs, um, just 
your basic human rights. And, and I think that if someone discovers all these other terms through the window of body positivity, then I don't think that that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it also has a lot to do with marketing and that's something Mm -hmm. that none of us really have a say in when it comes to how our, our book is marketed. Um, you know, and, and so that we do that the best that we can, um, to explain what these terms, um, and how we connect to them, uh, mean to us. I would say that as we kind of mentioned, the system is sick. (laughs) So like as a marginalized person, you kind of learn how to navigate the system. Like, you know, with black people, we code switch. And so it's like, well, I have to assimilate in order to thrive in this system and a system inherently that is set against me. And with like this book, it's fat liberation, but we're already working in an environment, a publishing industry, a marketing industry, an entire society that is fat phobic. So, but they're really happy about body positivity. And so it's like, well, if we can ride that wave so that we can get where we're supposed to be because we're already underserved. And unfortunately we have to face the music on that. We're underserved, nobody's coming to us for fat liberation. Like nobody's Google seeing that to find us, but the people who Google body positivity because they're too scared to look at fat liberation. They don't know, especially teens. I'm not gonna say that teens don't know, but they may not even know the terms in which to find us. It, for marketing wise, it just makes more sense to ride the bigger wave in hopes that we can shine at some point instead of all the other people who are riding this wave who, you know, you're like, <laughs> you know what this movement is, you know? So it's one of those, it's a catch 22. It really sucks, but also, you know, instead of us niching completely down and alienating ourselves in a niched already alienated space, we're trying to thrive and we're trying to make moves and change. And sometimes you have to play with people you don't want to play with, (laughs) or at least I shouldn't say that you have to play and you have to use other rules that are already set in place to keep the you out to get in. So you have to be a bit subversive then. Yeah, you that's it, to, subversive. Don't turn it back to your own, okay. don't turn it back on your own, for your own uses. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had another question um, and this was, do you think there will be more YA body positive works going forward or is this a flash in the pan? Cause we know sometimes YA, mm-hmm literature has trends and fads and what have you no and this is the way you you don't you hold the publishing community accountable like the way that you do that is by being vocal so the whole thing last year with black lives matter and all of a sudden publishers are just rushing to grab up black books keep them accountable you know what i mean body positivity is something that needs to be on shelves you know BIPOC books or something that needs to be on shelves. The way that we do that is by keeping publishers accountable. And when we don't see that, or we haven't seen it, just being like, oh, well, what's up? I thought y'all, I thought y'all said this. I think sometimes, especially if you're already a published writer, a traditionally published writer, you're afraid of stepping on toes and you're just like, well, what if I post this? Or what is this going to say? Like, I'm, I've moved past that. <laughs> like, so I, I think that the way that uh, you do it, even you know, traditionally, published writer, self-published, a reader, the way you do it is by holding publishing accountable consistently, loudly, and just let them know, like, this is what we want. We spend our money and this is what we want to see because market demand drives the market. So you have to demand to see these things. And that's, you know, to me, the, the way we can ensure that it wouldn't be like a flash in the pan, although I don't think body diversity with a lot of the books that I see coming out, this isn't going to be a flash in the pan thing, but the way that we further ensure, like I said, is by being loud and being vocal to publishing about what we want to see and what we want to read. I actually think there's quite a lot of stuff that's coming out that feature, features body diversity and features fat characters coming out in publishing. 
I think that publishing is doing a lot better actually than many other forms of media. Like there's still virtually no representation of fat people in film or on television. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's like you, like, I mean, like we always play this game as writers, like cast your, if your book was a movie, how are you going to cast mm -hmm. it? And it's like, either you can't cast your YA movie with fat characters because there's such a few, you know, so few people that are successful in the mm -hmm. space, or you see like the same three people all the time because there's like, you know, I, I sometimes I feel like it's like Star Wars, you know, it's like Lord of the Sith. There can only be two. There can only be two <laughs> fat celebrities at any given time. And so it's like, once you know one is not working anymore then you get a second one but there can only be the two so i i actually think publishing is doing better than some places i am worried though that publishing is picking fat books against each other because literally in july there was like eight fat books published ah! that's never happened before i'm sorry did you hear that my dog's complaining at me <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like for me that's a worry of mine because like do you expect every fat reader to buy eight books a, a month? That's a lot of expectation, right? So I'm hoping that readers will go out there and do what Catherine said and support and buy the books and show publishing that we are gonna stand up for fat characters. So yeah, but right now they are publishing a lot. Like this year has been, I think, um, like instrument, there's like eight, nine in the anthology with fat main characters. I've never seen that. I think we've had maybe one or two a year with a fat main character from Dumpling On, so. Yeah, this yeah. has been a stellar year for fat mm -hmm. main books. Mm -hmm. And I think that obviously the audience is out there. It's, I, I think that it's, when you look at it in the same way with fashion, if people put the money into making fat fashion accessible, people would be spending money. People want clothes to wear. And, and if they put that marketing and time and effort and made it accessible to everyone, people would be going here, take my money. I want clothes, you know? And it's just, sometimes people are so blinded by what society deems is acceptable that they're not seeing the larger picture. And so I think that like with Rebecca saying that there were eight or so books out in June and July. If these books do well, it's going to further mm -hmm. next year and the year after and the year after. And there are kids who are dying for these books. Mm -hmm. They want to see themselves on the shelves. And I also think that what's really amazing about that is that then us as authors aren't competing against um, the idea that these stories have to be a certain way to be acceptable because mm -hmm. you're getting so many more versions of the experience. And that mm -hmm. gives writers for future stories more freedom to experiment with the stories that they really wanna tell and, 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 and have them be bought, I think. Well, that's great. I know at, at, in the library, we try to do everything we can to help, you know, promote and give you all the platform and, and share. You guys are awesome. Out. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Yes. I, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, all of you, for taking the time out of your very busy lives to be here with us tonight. Um, I just want to let everyone know, um, thank, I thank all of our, get, or all, all of our attendees that came tonight to listen to this discussion. And remind everyone that we did record the event and so it will be available in a few days on our YouTube channel and will be there for as long as people want to watch it. So once it's there, share it widely, share it with your friends. This has been such a fantastic conversation tonight. I enjoyed it so much. And again, I'm so sorry that it has to end. Um, but we want to get Catherine to bed because she's, you know, she's, she's, she's way back east. <laughs> um, but I want to let folks know that we have a lot more author events coming up here through the end of the year. The next one in September is Omar El Akkad, the author of American War and What Strange Paradise. He's going to join us on September 15th at 3 p.m. We hope you'll join us too. And a reminder that people can join from anywhere they want to because it is virtual. And that has been one of the most wonderful things about having these types of programs is that we can bring together a panel like all of you from all over the U.S. and Canada. It's an international panel. So 
thank you all. Um, we hope that everyone enjoyed their time tonight. Oh, we've got someone in Pennsylvania over in chat. Wow, fantastic. Yay, that's exciting to hear. Thank you so much for letting us know. Um, if folks want to learn more about our author events, they can go to our website at snowwild.org forward slash open book. And I want to thank everyone. Goodbye. I hate to say goodbye. This has been so much fun. Hope thank to have you. you all back sometime too. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.